did. Uh, oh, is that that maybe that's yeah, what we yeah, didn't do, yeah, right? We didn't do that. Okay. And uh, oh, that's good. The to know. other thing is the battery on in in the, the remote mic. The, yeah. It char it's a little rechargeable that's battery. Right. It goes right. into the. Oh yeah, it charges in the unit. Yeah. That's right. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah I thought that was pretty cool. When that I is that. pretty cool. In turn, reality guides us home, not hidden and esoteric mysteries, but to our most essential and natural self, our joy and fulfillment. And this is a reading from, uh, this is a reading from Habiba Ashki Kabir, who is the, the woman who's just gone, successfully gone through a, a, a breast cancer operation. We live in a world of immense beauty, and yet we have 
have not yet arrived at a place where we are in harmony with all of life. Transformation begins by holding a vision of possibility and then taking action in season to bring this vision into form. Human beings are meant to stand in the crossover point between heaven and earth, between past and future, called Kai, Kayali, the Kayali realm in the Sufi tradition. It is the place also called the imaginal realm. This is where change first occurs. Can we imagine in this moment and these days ahead a world in which every being is governed, is being given equal rights to a life of meaning and purpose, where nature and earth have rights, where we are all living the true purpose and all have all we need to sustain ourselves and our families. Can we imagine a world where pollution has stopped, where only sustainable energy and material are used to create environments where humans live and work? Can we imagine all people working together to solve global warming, to heal results of a century of pollution and environmental degradation, to alleviate the ramifications of eons of social injustice and violence? Can we imagine together a world where everyone has a voice and is listened to with honor and respect? Can we imagine a world with ritual restored to heal, to guide us through transitions and to give thanks? Together, we can imagine a bright new future. We can sing, write, draw, share this vision with others so that excitement and hope can arise once again on this beautiful planet we call home. Our hearts are calling us to work together, to feed the hungry and offer a drink of cool water to the thirsty. Our hearts are calling us to seek a new way of walking on this earth beneath our feet. We came here to be a blessing to the world. There's work for us to do, and our life is inviting us, inviting us into it every moment. facilitated two classes exploring faith for the LIR community, the learning and retirement here in Nelson. Her uh, focus is about interfaith dialogue and understanding the realization that we are one with, you know, with many, many ways, and the, with the many ways we express that. So, there she is. <laughs> Hello. I don't know if this mic is on. Yes, no. Uh, I don't know. I have a soft voice, but I will project that one. Go ahead. So, uh, if I keep talking, things happen. <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll see what happens now. Um, no? Frank and John. Let's see if this works. No? Maybe closer. Maybe closer? No. Maybe farther away. Frank the gain on it. I've got it. Oh. Okay. Well, I'll use the hand mic. And I'm, I'm actually... Wait, wait, right here. Do you hear it? Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. It's holding me in my seat because I'm a speaker and a minister I'm used to moving around and have a pulpit and whatever. So this is a good practice for a little echo and holding me in my seat. Hey, can I move the chair? Move to your right a bit, Janet. Can you move to your right a bit? Okay. Another whole foot. Sure. Probably will help reduce the feedback. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay. 
thank you for the beautiful readings. I love this season. I really feel so privileged to be here and to share Christmas and the deeper meaning of what the story is all about. Because this is a time, especially the time in the world we live in now, that can feel like there is an enormous amount of darkness. So I feel it's my privilege to just really just speak about the light that you've read about, that we all know about, and to really incorporate it because there's one thing to speak and there's another thing to get involved in the story. And we hear the story so many times. So I'm going to retell the story and look at some aspects of it. And then I'm going to introduce Richard, who's going to a poet that I've discovered, a Nelson poet, who is going to uh, complete the talk with a poem he wrote about Advent. And um, then we'll have some time to really reflect. And I share that because I do a spiritual practice during Advent, which is a practice of welcoming. It's welcoming the Christ light, the light on the planet, allowing ourselves to be open and receptive. So I take time to really engage in the story and make it my own. And that's what I hope to share with you today. First of all, I wanted to start with the Marianne Williamson quote that says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that makes us most frightened. It's a powerful image. It's our light. And the Christmas story is a Christmas story of light. And um, it, it's a story of birth, and it's a story about the light in each of us. So I wanted to tell the story in a way that we follow the light within ourselves, accept the gifts that we've been given, and know that there's always a happy ending to the story. So I always start, and I will pass this out in a minute, but I always start the story with um, <clears throat> the deeper meaning. So as we know in the story, in Advent, or before Advent, the angel of the Lord appears to Mary. And, the, and Mary is in prayer. And if you take the story to be your own story, we're going to tap into our own Mary, the receptive part of ourselves, the openness. And the angel of the Lord, our higher thought, which is what an angel is, it is the highest thought we have, it appears to us, it comes to us, and especially when we're in a most receptive mood. The angel of the Lord appears to Mary and says, Mary, full of grace, you who are in prayer, who opens your heart, who has a willingness, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. The Lord is with us. The moment we're in prayer, the Lord is with us. And that light, that divine presence is, is immediately there. So the angel appears and asks Mary to become the mother of God, to birth light into the world. This is something we're asking ourselves all the time. In that receptive way, the angel, that higher thought in us, in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, is asking to bring forth more good, more love, more light. So the angel appears to us. So thinking about your own life, how is the angel in your own life appearing to you? What is it right now that's your highest thought about yourself, your work, your life, your health, your wholeness, whatever it is, the angel of the Lord is appearing. And when you say yes to that higher thought, I'm willing to live a fuller life, more peace, more love, more joy, your Mary gets activated because something in you says yes to something beyond the limits of your personal experience right now. So I talk fast and put a lot of stuff in a little sentence. You can see that. But I just ask for some reflection on these things because if you really get the story, we will leave here transform people. And that poem of Robert uh, Thurman's, it will inspire us to move forward. So just touching into our angel and to our Mary, our receptive side, then we take the Joseph. Who's Joseph in the story? Where is Joseph in this? Now, I, Joseph is always my favorite part of the story because, you know, just think about Mary going to her fiancé saying, guess what, honey? <laughs> got to be a strong man <laughs> to 
really get what's happening. So Joseph in the story is the part of ourselves that comes up against unbelief, comes up against the miraculous is impossible, comes up against the news on CNN, comes up against Fox, or whatever it is, that part of ourselves always is activated. And right now, in the history of our culture and our planet, whoa, it feels overwhelming, at least to me. And my Joseph has to step up and look at that news and say, good is not impossible. This is not the end of the story. There is something unfolding that is so much greater, and it's out of my hands. It's divinely inspired. This is part of the story, but it's not the whole story. Joseph, when getting this news, he was an honorable person. He really struggled with justice and mercy, because by justice, Joseph could have broken the engagement and ended the whole um, relationship with Mary easily. But mercy comes in when he understood what a disgrace it would be for her. And he thought beyond his own self to someone else. And he applied justice and mercy together in a moment that allowed something new to happen. This is the work of our times. We can't look at the world and not discuss justice, but we also have to look at the world that discusses mercy. I once heard Ram Dass say, until um, Richard Nixon is on my prayer table, I'm not doing my work. <laughs> Whoa. Do you get what the call is? Justice, yes, and mercy. So that's something that we're all having to work with if we're really going to transform and it's not just lip service. We have to take the stories and the culture of our time and incorporate it. And if we are people of prayer, people that light candles, people that gather together and sing about hope and goodness and the unfoldment of grace, then this is our story. Christmas is not a Christian story. It's a birth story. It's a story of life. It's a universal story that calls each and every one of us. So um, the Joseph in us is the protective side of what we know. The deeper understanding that we have in our life. Apply to yourself. Where is it that you have to protect your own heart? Where is it that you can't go over the line and get so involved in the culture that you lose the ability, that I lose the ability to still proclaim the presence of light, of love, of grace, of mercy, and justice? Where is that place? I mean, I have to limit myself. I've had to discipline myself from the seduction of news and what's happening next and where are we going. It requires something of us. We're people of the light, and we also, while taking in that information, have to turn ourselves to the light and sit and bathe in that and be the Mary, just receptive, gesting. We have to have gestation into grace, into letting something new be born. We cannot be unpassionate about not leaving the world in the condition it is as a grandmother. I just can't do it. And I ask myself, what can I do? Another demonstration, another letter to the editor? What is it that I can do? Well. I don't do those things, I, I can and I do sometimes, but what I can do is pull my attention away, be in the Mary receptive to grace, and be guided to my next action. Not think that I have to push through it. There is a divine presence of light here on the planet guiding us, but we, have, we need silence. We need something that I appreciate about the poem of Richard, it was like sitting in silence so I can hear something. What wants to emerge? Personalize it. What wants to emerge in your life as a grandmother, as a friend, as a companion, as a part of a community? What's looking to emerge? And so the Joseph is protecting that so you give yourself enough time for prayer, enough positive music, enough turning off the news, whatever you have to do to incorporate that for yourself, for myself. I'm just speaking to myself, and thanks for listening. <laughs> no, it goes like that. And the story, and in the beginning of the story, so Mary say, says yes, and there's the conversation between Joseph and Mary. Would have loved to have been there, but that conversation <laughs> happened. And then um, they set off 
uh, to um, Bethlehem. They set off because they, there's a consensus being taken and it's part of their culture that they have to go there. So they get to um, Bethlehem and Mary is now very pregnant and going into labor. And the story goes, they're looking for room and there's no room in the inn. And it's such a, a metaphor for when we're traveling on the spiritual journey and we get to places really that don't call us to our humility, that are very, you know, that just don't call us to that, then there'll be no room at the end. The end symbolizes comfort and, and all the things that are pleasant. But when you're journeying, sometimes it isn't always that way. It's not always pleasant. And that's when I want to get out of it. That's when I don't want to finish the practice. That's when the discipline wavers. So, you know, check in uh, where the um, community center. I'm sure there's big signs that sign up in January and by February the numbers go down. Because the discipline that is required requires humility. Like, I don't feel like doing it. I don't maybe want to do it. I don't want to forgive that person. I don't even want to bless that person. I don't even want to like Donald Trump. Oh, excuse me, how did that come out of my mouth? Um, how these things unfold, you know, requires something. It requires leaving the inn and going into the stable and letting something else be born. Having a humility about ourselves, that we're here by divine purpose, that there is guidance. Angels appear to us. Stars guide us. There is something here for each and every one of us, and you'll have to, you know, understand what that is for you and find it in yourself. But the star, that that picture on every Christmas card, there's a star, there's a light that calls us, it guides us. It's in us, around us, through us, and lives as us. It's actually who we are. And the birth of Christ is the birth of us, that our consciousness can look up and see something greater than what's appearing now. There is evolution. There's spiritual evolution. You know, it, they, they keep evolution limited to our biology, but it's so much more than that. And that's what this season, if we allow it to do what it really can do, and we retell the story to ourselves about ourselves, then something very transformative happens. So the star is there, Mary and Joseph are in the manger, and then the shepherds who are tending their sheep in the fields look up and they are guided by the star to go to Bethlehem. Well, the shepherds are us at our work, at what preoccupies us. We're in the field tending our sheep. We're busy, we're shopping, we're doing this, that, and the other thing. We're busy, busy, busy. But the moment we stop, in the busyness, and just think of culturally where we are today. The moment we stop at that and look up, something else has a moment, has a chance to come forward. We see a light, ah, illumination. Something illumines in us, and we go, oh my gosh, here I am working, working, working. I've had no time for my spiritual self, for my spiritual life, for my own heart, for the work that's required of me. It's not just to get spiritually fed. When I get spiritually fed, I have to go through my list of, oh, forgiveness and all of those things. And this is hard work. Like, I, there's a couple people I don't really want to forgive. I don't. But I make a list of my own sins, so to speak, so I can keep in the manger. Because once I think I'm above forgiveness, that I am so righteous or that I don't really have to do that, I'm on the wrong track. The story's, I'm lost in the story somewhere. And it's not something that's, it's a requirement of people who are evolutionarily interested in spiritual unfolding on the planet Earth. And the angels message our highest understanding, peace on Earth, goodwill to all people. And that's a requirement. It's just part of the story <laughs> and it's there. Then, so the shepherds represent that peace when you see them and place them in the manger. Like I have three mangers around my house and I invite my grandkids to come in and we move all the pieces around. And 
Sometimes the shepherds have a good spot. Sometimes the wise men move on. You know, we just play with the story and we talk about the story because it's so poignant in the culture we live in. You can't get away from the story. Whether you consider yourself Christian or not, it's not about that. It's about us. So, um, so that's the shepherds. And then the wise men. The wise men come from the east, the, the place of new births, the beginning, the sun rising. They come with wisdom and they bring gifts. And when we are willing to receive the gifts that come with wisdom, we can understand everything intellectually. I can anyway. I can understand it and read the story and love it. But there's something about receiving. See, Mary is the feminine principle of receptivity in the story. She's the receiver. And these are gifts that come. <clears throat> and the wise men bring them. And they have to be received. Everyone in this room, we all have our own personal gifts. You have something that no one else can offer. You have something that no one else can bring. It's your personal gift. Unless you receive that, really say, this is my, this is the gift I've been given, and use it. I have three children, and one of them were having the conversation, are you using the gifts? There's a survival mentality that I have to address that says, you know, worried about work, worried about job, will I have enough? And into that conversation, I have to say, what are the gifts you've been given? If you use those gifts and follow them, you will find the right path for you to be on. Your work won't be about survival, it'll be about creativity. It'll be about something new. So it's very, very important that we receive the gifts we've been given. And you you know what that is. What do you love to do? Where are your passions? Once you touch your passion, that's part of your gift. You got it. And so moving in that direction. And <clears throat> then we have always there's an antagonist. Right? <laughs> Isn't there always an antagonist in the story? In comes Herod. Oh, bad Herod. And um, Herod is truly um, our ego when it's off balance. So what happens is the wise men come and they say, we're seeking something greater. Uh, we're seeking more light. We're seeking the king. And of course, Herod is not going to be dethroned. And our own egos work that way. Mine does. You might have surpassed it, and please come to me afterwards and tell me how you did it. But if your ego, and it's so easy to do, it's not a bad word. Ego is not a bad word, but it looks bad in the story. And it can go off track, because ego is our self-preservation and things like that. It's not something to be afraid of, unless, unless we can't take anybody else's greatness. You know, the ego goes off track when it's all about us. And, you know, talk about the culture. It's all about me. Am I alone? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, it's all about me. Oh, yeah, that's right. But there are some things that we see in the world and we've gotten so commercialized about ourselves that when Herod comes, Herod says, oh, show me, show me where the king is so I can come and worship, so I can really help. And um, what happens is the wise men take him on his word, of course, and they go and they bring their gifts. And when they're on their way back to Herod to tell him where the child is, what happens is um, an angel, a higher thought, an intuition, appears to <coughs> them, comes to them, and says, don't go that way. Did you ever walk in a room and have an intuition about someone, but you try to deny it? No, I don't really feel that way. Your intuition is your guide. It doesn't mean it means hmm, that might not be the right situation, circumstance, person, setting. Our intuition is always at work. So checking in on that, the um, wise men say, hmm, maybe we'll go another way. And they go about and don't stop where Herod is to tell him where the child is. Well, of course, this infuriates Herod. And 
he's now more nervous than ever that someone is going to dethrone him, that there is a child that is greater than he is, and that child is going to grow up, and he's threatened. All I can say, and I just say this, every time I feel threatened, somebody threatens me in some way. <gasps> They're smarter. I don't, I'm not, a, it's always I'm not enough of. It's always the signal. Oh, they have it better. But whatever it is, it always has a little hinge of there's not enough. I'm not enough. This is not enough. Whatever I'm doing is not enough. It's a, the negative aspect of ourselves that starts to trigger in Herod. So in the story, Herod goes and kills all babies under two years old. It's called the Feast of Holy Innocence. The innocence of ourselves, that we are magical, that we're born under a star, that God has a blessing for us, that we're here by divine appointment. That magical information gets usurped into another idea. I'm not enough. The not enoughness is what runs probably the whole culture, the whole commercialism of the planet right now. I'm not enough, but if I buy more, if I get more, if I do more, then I'm going to be okay. And the Christmas story is our story, that we're okay right now. Who we are is perfect. We're here by divine appointment. God appointed us to be here at this time to bring forth our light and our gifts. That's what it's all about. So when Herod comes in, Herod's the sneakiest of all. I mean, Herod, because, oh, I just want to worship the child like you do. It takes a while to get your wisdom. And if you're a parent or a grandparent, which a lot of us are, we've gone through enough Herods that when we see our kids, or when I see my kids, I'm like, what's wrong for Herod? <laughs> <laughs> you see it. You understand what it is. It's not a mystery anymore. It takes wisdom, and it takes going under the spell for a while to realize, wow, this does not work for me. This will not take me where I want to go. This will not bring the Christ light that I long to see on earth unfold itself. It just won't do it. So I have to pull myself back into my Mary, into my receptiveness, and say, what is the guidance here? What's the grace here? What can I do here to bring forth something else? How can I forgive myself for my own feelings? They come up. I know it's the human thing. But I want the supernatural experience of your presence, your grace, to eliminate that feeling. Let me know that I'm here by your grace, your love, your divine appointment, so I can let go of those insecurities of not enoughness. It's a work. It's the work of our culture right now. Because the reason I believe myself personally that we go into all of the super high drama of Christmas and why most of us go, oh my God, too commercial, too much, is because Herod is so deceptive. Herod is so sneaky. The, all the stuff out there is supposed to fill us up. Because we're, and the message under fill us up is not enough. I am not enough. So if I have this, then I'll be okay. And I'm not against that, uh, honestly, that isn't, the, but it's when it's overdone and culturally overdone. So that's Herod, and he's always there. And Joseph and Mary went to Egypt, and they, in going there, they had a temporary place of rest. If you do not engage with Herod in the way that he demands, there will be a temporary place of rest. There'll be a place of rest until the next evolution comes up because we're evolutionary there'll be more challenges we live in this time together as a culture we're all together in the same time right now we understand what's happening we're looking at the physical world falling apart the spiritual world the political world it's all up there for grabs and it always comes to not enoughness look at the if, if i can make an other then I can feel a lot better about myself. I'm back on the kingdom, in the queendom. So it, it really takes paying attention to how we language, how we write, how we think, how we engage. So um, I'm going to pass this out. I love to give these out at Easter. I mean, at Christmas, Easter, it's all one thing to me. But um, this is having a, 
an exercise that I invite you to do. I invite you to, if you have a candle at home, to light it. And then just go through these questions. And this is the birthing of Christ within you. This is a Christmas exercise to move you forward. Uh, when has the angel appeared to you? When has your higher thought, when has that angel appeared? Then when you're opening to that, what are your fears? What are the fears? So when your higher thought says, you know, write that book, sing that song, do whatever it is you're called to do, what are the fears that come up? Can't do it, not enough, I'm scared, blah, 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 whatever stories you have, just to look at them. How does Mary activate your receptivity to birthing something new? How do you tap the Mary in you that just says, I'm willing, I don't know what this means, but I'm willing to move forward in the unknown. And then your Joseph gets activated, and then how do you protect that? What are you going to do after you make that decision? How are you going to protect it? You have to pick an exercise, a discipline, something. How are you going to protect that? And what is your guidance? What star are you following right now? I love the reading today. Those are stars to follow, to hear those things, to read them. And then the next, uh, what work needs to be done or undone so you'll follow the star? So we have work to do and we have work to undo. Sometimes we've done things and we haven't apologized or we haven't corrected it. <coughs> what, what would that be? What gifts will you receive by allowing your wisdom to guide you? What do you think you're going to get? If you really followed your star, what gifts are you going to receive? Because if you can even anticipate them, they're already yours. But you can't make it up. They're already there if you anticipate them. And then what gets in your way? The willingness to let that go. And what would allow you to feel safe and allow you to rest in this safety? So um, I'm going to pass those out. And... I talk so fast and so full of the spirit that I don't even know if I'm 10 minutes or two minutes or where I am, but how am I doing? You're doing great. Okay. Perfect. So, perfect. Absolutely perfect. Anything that Your light any, is shining. <laughs> anything that anybody wants to add to that or have something to say or I love the conversation and dialogue on what this could all mean. I, I thank you very much. I really like that retelling of the story. I hadn't heard that interpretation before. And, uh, um, yes, yeah, thank you very much. So, um, and you can tell I'm a bit enthusiastic. I can get into my passion. And, um, so what was happening, I was in learning and retirement, and um, I had been reading about and really sitting in the advent of Mary, in the receptivity of Mary, and just, oh, what is, what is this? And then I met Richard, who's the poet, and he said, how are you? And you think I'm talking fast now, Richard, I'm like, I've heard of it, I've been to all Mary's being a birth, and Richard was like, whoa. <laughs> Could I write a poem about that? I love it, because he's a really lovely poet. So um, he's going to read for us, and then um, we'll just have a moment to reflect. And it's really about being in the silence. And I just thank you for being such a very open and diverse community that can hear the story way past its Christian message. And you can hear how beautiful it really is. It's an amazing, incredible awe-inspiring story. I mean, I'm a lover of Jesus. I think, you know, he went on to do the happy ending of the story because I believe that I can move past my own limitation to actually contemplate who is my death and that you can resurrect out of anything. And that's what that story, I mean, it has, it's a book-ended story. It's a birth and a death that doesn't end. And however you believe it literally, or the love that he brought, or the message that he brought doesn't die, however it is, it's the birth and the continuing life story. So thank you for letting me share it and share my passion for it. Thank you so much. Thank you.
the mic. Yeah, if you use the mic, yeah, okay. Well, um, uh, I'd like to, like when I was, I think I might light a candle. And um, because, oh, uh, I feel very, very humbled to be, be here with us and with us. And because, um, like Janet was saying, within, within her story, she, let me tell you, she was a tsunami. She, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and I read her a poem, and, and then she said, you know, could you, could you write a poem? And I said, well, I should, sure can try. But usually I write these little fortune cookie poems of about <laughs> six lines. And in that, those six lines, okay, like Michael knows, I, I, I try to put these things together to honor moments. So I'd like to thank Jana for your inspiration and bringing me back to the story. And also, like, when I get into the poem itself, I, I thought I had to acknowledge, after listening to Janet, then uh, I was listening to some uh, broadcast of sorts, and uh, Cornell West was talking with uh, Terrence Blanchard, a jazz musician, and they talked about Beethoven and music and its power. So those are some of the recollections that, that I bring into this poem because I wanted to honor not only the story that we're talking about today, but also the story that Janet presented to me in such a wonderful, lyrical kind of way and invited me in. So here we go. Clarity of Silence. Please come sit with me. I can see you have been traveling. Join me, listening as I do, for the clarity of the silence. Let's dwell in sacred places. Let's dwell, or sorry, let's dwell in secret places, entering a mystery bigger than the confines of our daily lives, probing our finite. Sorry, dear. I'm saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Probing our finite understanding. Probing our finite understanding with the time we are given. Let us dissolve the boundaries within the clarity of silence. What is the heart of my question? Beneath the stains of time, the poet scratches for answers with a pen and words. Searching the calendar, nearing winter solstice, a seed had been sown, a spell had been cast, a symbolic coming of the birth. Echoes of promise as Aramaic voices proclaim a coming to be rejoiced. Within the coming of a clarity in the silence. Thank you again for being at my side as this mystery seeks meaning. An understanding embedded in a story told 2,000 years ago to the world. Even unheard, it still touches you through its spell within the dimensions of the silence. Giving meaning to a life, providing meaning enrichment to our own lives. How, how do I find a metaphor to bridge a journey that brought an awakening from suffering and violence into a tribute to peace and love, to a meditated clarity of our time, for clarity of silence in the spirit. Let us give attention to the weaving of sounds, ancient music. Was it Beethoven who found that music lay between the notes within the silence? So let me invite us to seek a space between the notes that signify music. Because music can be, be deeper than philosophy and science, because in the end, we are finite as we are. Language or linguistic elegance can't fully get to the truth of our experience. My mind takes me to the preparations of a birth. Was there a midwife? Did they count all his fingers and toes? Would the husband shed tears of pure joy, witnessing a strength, a resilience in his wife that left him in awe? Awe amidst the mystery of meaning and hope. 
a birth full of destiny, anticipation, prophesized fate. I had thought as in everything, tomorrow would just be another day. Knowing, but know now, it couldn't be. So next time, let's not sit. Let's get up, put up, pick up our walking sticks, put on our walking hats, and go on a pilgrimage. A journey as they did so long ago, anticipating the arrival. I will walk with you, not just as a memory, but as peace within my heart, seeking to find you within the clarity of silence. Thank you. Oops. Thank you, Richard. This is way high. Okay, thank you, Richard. Are there any other um, questions, comments right now? Anybody want to say? I, I, I feel all in awe, I know. <laughs> and all in contemplative places, so it's hard to say. But uh, announcements? Pardon? Oh, you know what? I forgot something. I forgot something very important. And um, what I'd like to do. Thank you, John. Is. Um, can you sing this with me? Well, we're going to have announcements. Well, I'm going to do the announcements first. Yeah. Okay. So the seven. Oh, okay. That's what you wrote. Is that what you wrote? You put the John. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, it, it, it takes a village. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> put it up? Please. And there's a, there's a name that it says. There's Would a, you like the microphone? No. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth. The warmth of community or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Just be the Thank you, Lee. And announcements? Or do you want to do no, I have, I have a couple of announcements. Uh, do you have announcements? Of course. Oh, sorry. Oh, then get over there. I guess uh, next Sunday we will not be meeting here. Is that correct? No, that's correct, John. Okay. Where are we going? I don't know. <laughs> so can I guess. Valakin. Valakin Hole. Okay. So are we carpooling or is So if anyone needs a ride or wants to carpool, definitely, you know, talk to people who, whoever is going. <clears throat> yes? You, you have a question? You'll vote this. Some of us may not know about this. All right. Uh, I went last year. Oh, did you? I did. Oh, and you survived? Oh, I sang. Wow. Uh, probably for the first time in my life. <laughs> um, it's a Christmas sing-along in the Valican Hole put on by the Valican Community Choir starting at 3 o'clock next Sunday. Uh, get there early. It's, it's going to be busy. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Marsha and, and Dale are in the choir, and, um, and there's the same old songs you know, but they distribute song sheets. And there's some performances as well, some, some beautiful vocals. It's um, it's good old time, nice thing. Yeah. And then the new choir choir will be there as well. Oh right, yeah. 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 Do they do they have a potluck with it or is it no no? Okay, so when did, when was it finished last time? I think about. we left before six. Yeah, I, I wrapped about five five thirty. It wasn't it wasn't choir, real long. The choir performs maybe an hour or two, and it's quite moving. It's, it's beautiful yeah. music. And then you get in your stage for the sing along. There are a lot of goodies.
treats. Uh, oh, yeah. They, they, that's right, you were. were. Uh, lots of treats. Oh, uh, yeah, it was a nice no, country I, Christmas. I, my main concern was that uh, food. <laughs> 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 uh, he's getting back in the dark, driving back in the dark. Yeah. So, Michael, Marilyn, and myself are teaming up to go to the concert unless it's a howling blizzard. And there may be an extra space in the car unless, unless Anne uh, wants to come with us. So just so you know, we'd probably leave Nelson there. What would you recommend it would be a good time to leave Nelson to get there? I wouldn't leave later than two because no, I, we got there a little late. We had trouble finding a place to sit, so. So maybe leave Nelson a quarter to two. It only takes half an hour to get there. Oh. Right, a lot of socializing. I'm wondering if uh, some people who have extra space would want to come here at about uh, quarter to two, and, and uh, those of us who would like to get a ride could be here too and team up that way. How many people would like a ride? Okay, so there's at least, so apparently she's going. Yeah. yeah You're going, like right? Okay, so she's. All right, so then we need another car with drivers. Okay. Are you going? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay. Well, I have three announcements. <laughs> First, uh, today at 3 o'clock at the Capitol Theater, they're doing a performance of uh, Stella Natalis, the, the birth star, as you mentioned. And uh, it's a, a new composition by Paul Jenkins with the uh, Nelson Choir and uh, Choral Society. And uh, did it last night. We're going to do it this it's afternoon, stellar. too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's uh, really good. Really lovely. And um, so that's today. Next Sunday also is uh, Rumi's Urs, uh, and it's a celebration that's going to be at the Moving Center at 7 o'clock of poetry and uh, dancing of Rumi, uh, uh, Dances Universal Peace of Rumi. What's in Urs? And, and uh, that's, that's the marriage day of, of uh, Rumi. In the Sufi tradition, we talk about the death as being a marriage, that your marriage is into the in the, in the realm of Allah. So it's a beautiful marriage. So that's what we call the Urs. Um, and then um, uh, the 22nd, right here, we're having a, a prayer vigil from the Interfaith uh, Prayer Vigil Council that's dealing with uh, global warming and environmental concerns. At so seven. anybody? At, huh? at 7? At 7 o'clock, yeah. So if anybody, I'm going to be leading it, and if anybody wants to contribute uh, anything that they'd like to say or do, uh, let me know, and we'll, we'll work, it, work it out from there. Thanks very much. Excuse me, John, the, the Rumi, did you have a center, did you say? Yes, it's at the Moving Center. The Moving Center on Broadway. I, on uh, on <laughs> Baker Street. <laughs> Our Broadway, okay. Baker Street. Five, three. Baker Street, you walk up 17 stairs, there's only a door. <laughs> Thank you. Thank I'll check you. with you later on that. I've already forgotten what you said. Yeah. Yeah. Last year, it was a marvelous, just to show you what technology is about, uh, they had a, a person who uh, spoke Persian, Farsi, and he was reading uh, the poems of Rumi, which were written in, in, um, in Persian. Uh, and he was uh, reading it in Persian, and he was reading it off his uh, iPhone. <laughs> Direct connection, I guess. <laughs> and uh, the Sunday after next is uh, John and Allie. Imagine that. Uh, and uh, the, the topic will be the Divine Feminine. And uh, we'll see how that turns out. It will have a different, you know, maybe more elaborate title then, but that's what that's what's gonna happen. It's gonna be is that, on, is that on Christmas Eve? It yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> that's right, it's the twenty fourth. Wow. Yeah, so that that would be Christmas Eve. Yeah. Their regular service. And does anyone else have an announcement? We seem to have a lot of them today. Just that there's coffee and cookies uh -huh. in the kitchen. Oh yeah. And please linger 
And maybe consider sharing which of the characters in Janet's Christmas story you related to, which path is yours right now? Herod. <laughs> in the moment. It's, we all, we all, well, you're not alone. <laughs> And, and we have a little song that goes with that. Do we? It's called We Are Saying Thank You. And, oh. and, we, and the words are we are saying thank you, and we say that three times, and then thank you is our practice. Okay. We, Why don't we stand? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. We are saying thank you. We are saying thank you. We are saying thank you. Thank you is our practice. We are saying thank you. We are saying thank you. We are saying thank you. Thank you is our practice.